Welcome to Neuro Movement Revolution with Anat Benyel, where you will discover breakthrough possibilities for your life through the brain's power to change. We're so happy that you can join us in making the impossible possible. Welcome to the Neuro Movement Revolution podcast. This is going to be our 44th podcast with my amazing friend and colleague, Linda Graham. The topic, we're going to have two separate topics with Linda today. The first, uh, the first podcast, half hour podcast, is going to be about trauma. And, uh, and Linda, I, I, so I'll tell you about Linda. Linda Graham is a marriage family therapist and is an experienced psychotherapist and mindful self-compassion teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area. Linda integrates modern neuroscience, mindfulness, and relational psychology in her national and international trainings. She's the author of a few absolutely wonderful books. The first is Resilience, Powerful Practices for uh, for Bouncing Back from Disappointment, Difficulty, and Even Disaster, and the award-winning Bouncing Back, Rewiring Your Brain for Maximum Resilience and Well-Being. 10 years of weekly resources for recovering resilience are archived on lindagraham-mft.net. We are gonna put all the links also on the podcast itself, so you can always find those links. So welcome, 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 Linda. Thank you, Anna. You know how much I enjoy working with you, so I look forward to this. This is wonderful. So the first thing that uh, we are, Uh, asking or I'm asking you here is um, in the topic of trauma maybe give us a little bit of background of your world or experience a a professional experience with trauma okay so trauma for a long time was seen as any external event that would overwhelm someone's coping mechanisms. The shift in the field has been to looking inside to a person's strengths and capacities to meet those external stressors. So now trauma work is focusing as much on a person's internal capacities as it does on the severity of the external trauma. In addition, trauma therapy recognizes that trauma memories from those external events are stored in the body implicitly. So trauma therapy has moved to be more body-based, working with the nervous system, working with regulating the nervous system, regulating emotions, and not just talk therapy. I once heard Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, at a conference on attachment and trauma say, if a therapist doesn't have a body-based trauma therapy in their toolkit, they could be guilty of malpractice. So it isn't just talk therapy that helps people cope with the challenges and adversities of their lives. It's actually being able to move through the body's implicit memories of the trauma or coping with the trauma that helps people recover from the trauma. So there are many of those modalities available now, EMDR, sensory motor, somatic experiencing, but they work with the body as well as with the mind to help people cope with trauma. Well, thank you. First of all, this is wonderful. Of course, uh, uh, my background was that I was trained as a psychotherapist and that was many years ago. And I went, what about the body? It was talk, talk, talk and theorizing. And it was the analytical Freudian model. And I went like, but what about this, the immediacy of the experience? So, and there was very little at the time to turn to. And I turned to Feldenkrais and there is no question that for me, it's not, it's like the mind and the body are truly not separate. So it's all a learning process. So trauma is a form of initial reaction and then a learned response. I mean, the trauma, the response to a specific trauma gets learned. 
we, we will respond to perceived external or internal stressors with a stress response. The nervous system activates yes. and mobilizes to meet the, the yes. stressor. And if that doesn't work, it will deactivate. It will immobilize. It will shut down. And so in trauma therapy, there's the idea, thanks to Dan Siegel, of the window of tolerance, a place where we can be calm and relaxed, engaged and alert. And from there, we can meet the challenges of daily living. When we're hyper aroused, too much sympathetic activation, we'll go into fight flight. When we're under activated, when we shut down and withdraw and numb out and collapse, there's too much parasympathetic in the nervous system. And then we don't move, we don't take action. So to be able to be regulated in our nervous system so that we can act wisely and effectively is what we're aiming for in trauma therapy. And you have to involve the body to be able to regulate the nervous system. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you, you speak about Dan Siegel, who's of course, whose work is wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I encountered the concept of trauma a, a many, many years ago, but through the book of Judith Herman, yeah, yeah. Trauma and Recovery. And she created the distinction of basically post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. she, she was extremely instrumental in that. Right. And she started a, 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 with the sexual trauma mm -hmm. people. And one of the things that really impressed on, on me when I read it is that trauma is not a signifier of weak, uh, weak, weakness or poor personality or something is wrong with you, that you can take any system and bring it to the point where, to what, what I, I can call the breaking point. And yeah. And so, so in, yeah, go ahead. In addition to that, I mean, trauma and trauma response for a long time has been seen as a pathology. But Janina Fisher, um, who is one of the leaders of sensory motor psychotherapy, says that trauma is a normal response to abnormal events. So yeah. not to pathologize the person for yeah. their response, for their stress response. They're simply doing the best they can to cope. And so we work with helping people find more adaptive, more effective ways of coping so the, the focus has shifted from the severity of the trauma to the person's capacities to cope with the trauma. And that's, we may talk about this now or in the second half of the podcast, but the emphasis is also shifting to post-traumatic growth and how people can not only recover from trauma, but use the trauma as an experience to grow and into new possibilities and new strengths and new opportunities. So the field of trauma therapy is evolving a lot as we learn what actually helps people recover their equilibrium, recover their inner stability and be able to cope with their life as they need to. Wonderful. So I would like to just bridge here because a, a, a big portion of the uh, listenership to this podcast are parents of children with special needs. And one of the things that, so first of all, I think the most almost the most neglected part of it is the trauma that the parents uh, experience due to the situation with their child. But but before we go there, there I want to talk about the child because that was the first place I really many years ago started thinking in, when we intervene looking to help the child with special needs. I saw from my point of view certain interventions that I thought were traumatic by nature, that they invite, a, 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 they can be, be experienced easily as trauma on the part of the child, certain therapies, certain you know, kinds of forcing or certain manipulations or devices or things like that. So, uh, and, and there's more and more awareness and more and more parents that are taking more an active role in choosing what will or will not be done with their child. So they're not like giving away the child to the authority in the sense of choosing what to do with the child. But one of the questions that parents often have is how do I know? So the question to, to you is what do you think a, 
or by your understanding could be conditions that invite the trauma response? What, what can a parent look for in terms of what the child is experiencing or how it occurs to the child? Well, so I would actually, as I've come to know you and your work, I actually look for what's working. I would look for what's working. And when you work with your clients and not, you try all different kinds of movement exercises and you see what lights up the brain and you go with that. And when someone is dealing with trauma or healing from trauma, you know, the brain learns best little and often small experiences repeated many times. So you try something experientially and you see if that allows more opening, more receptivity, more expansion, or does it lead to more contraction and reactivity and negativity? And so anything experiential to see if it works, to see if it's adaptive, that's how I help my clients who are suffering from trauma, external trauma, begin to experiment with what do they need to move in their body? How do they need to manage their negative and their positive emotions? How do they relate to their self-talk and what can we shift that would give them a different response? So in terms of looking for the responsiveness of the child, I'm looking for what works, what seems to open things up. The, so would you, I mean, what I look at and see how that matches is I, and I think you just said it in, in your way, I look to the child's, re, not just whether the intervention, so, okay. First, I want to di distinguish between emergency and ongoing mm -hmm. learning, rehab, uh, growth process. Emergency, something medical is required, then we do it. We try to do it in the most supportive, least painful, scary way, but we have to do it to save a life, right? Yeah. Uh, or to take care of the situation. But I'm talking about more the ongoing, once a week, five times a week, uh, you know, or at home mm -hmm. interaction and intervention. And one of the things that I noticed way early on is that people would do things with a child that were painful or extremely, I mean, the child actually could not perform. So the child would make great efforts, but it wouldn't work and people would do it again and again. And, it, 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 and I would say the child is learning their limitation, the child, and it's associating its experience to a lot of fear and negativity. And for a little child, if the parent is there or let, 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 let it be done to the child, the child also loses the, the safety with the parent at that moment. So, so there are many, many layers. And, and uh, that's one of the things that I say to parents, if, the, if this is the reaction, the child is not learning what they're supposed to learn, they're learning what they're experiencing. So there's many layers here, as you say. One of the layers is there may be organic impairment in the brain that you can work with, with the neural movement techniques. There can be impairment in brain functioning from external trauma, from adverse childhood experiences. And that's something that more and more physicians as well as therapists are learning, learning to assess for. But when there's emotional or physical or sexual abuse, when there's violence in the home, when there's alcohol, uh, substance abuse in the home, when people have been in prison, those negative experiences impact the development of the child's brain functioning so that they're less and less able to cope with life, less and less able to cope with trauma or recover from trauma. So a lot of the interventions there have to be at the experiential level, new experiences, new, more positive, more adaptive, more flexible experiences, so that the brain can learn new responses. The brain needs to recover its own functioning. You and I both work with neuroplasticity, the capacity of the brain to develop new circuitry, to learn new patterns. And so whatever kind of trauma, children are dealing with or their parents dealing with raising a special needs child and however that could be overwhelming to their own nervous system 
relying on the neuroplasticity, the capacity of the brain to change, which it will with experience, the brain learns from experience and it learns only from experience. So we pay attention to the experiences that the child is having or that the parent is having. And it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive, but positive experiences shift the functioning of the brain radically. That can be seen in the scanners. And so we practice positive experiences, positive emotions, positive interactions and connections, not just to feel better, but to shift the functioning of the brain so that we can do better. And that is something that parents can pay a lot of attention to is what positive interactions they're having with the child or that the, the child is experiencing on their own and really increasing the positivity, which increases brain function. This is wonderful. You know, I, I talk, my whole work is about waking up the brain and activating positive brain change. Yes. And the essentials create conditions that really facilitate that. And, and the, the, the idea, you said it counterintuitive, to do that, and for me, maybe I have been in this too long. It's it's not counterintuitive at all, but I understand what you say because when the child has challenges, there's an attempt to control the outcome, to try to make the child do what what is lacking at this moment, uh, uh, which is fully understandable because there's also a lot of anxiety around it, and it's kind of like there is the child just try again or just you know pull yourself up or it's also true for adults recovering from stroke recovering from any kind of accidents it's it's mm -hmm. exactly the same way because the learn really learns not just from experience it learns its experience it's like we learn hebrew if we're born in israel we learn english right. if we're born here right. we learn the experience we have and and failure is learned as well as success even though success promotes positive brain brain growth. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, let's focus a little bit uh, on the parents. You know, when we go to the second podcast, we will mm -hmm. focus on that. I, that took me a while. I was so focused on the children and figuring out how to help the children that mm -hmm. I, the parents were just the, the, the delivering the child and, you know, and we're in the room. And over time, I, I realized the depth of the challenge and the depth of the shock when something is not working right with your child. And, and one of the qualities so often with that is that it, it's not a one-time thing because the child is, the child is there uh, every day. So it's sort of reconfronting the, the, the challenge and the initial cause of the trauma, I mean, the initial trauma. Uh, what, I mean, I think, and I think many parents are so much in the take care mode of the child and of the situation that they might not even know that they're having a trauma response. So can you talk a little bit to a person that doesn't even think they're traumatized? Okay, so a um, couple layers to this as well. The most important relationship is the parent and the child. That's the attachment relationship that will develop security within the child's psyche and being. And so to have a good attachment relationship between parent and child that is nurturing, that is empathic, that is attuned, that is resonant, that is you know, following the child's lead. Parents need to be able to feel calm and strong and secure within themselves in order to do that. And one of the things that's taught in the mindful self-compassion protocol is compassion for caregivers, mm. how to cultivate compassion for the caregiver, whether that's professional or the parents, someone caring for someone in their family, but how necessary it is for a parent, any caregiver to have compassion for themselves for what they're going through as well as compassion for their child, just a recognition of the experience and the worry, the angst, the distress of the experience and taking time to say, this is hard, this is difficult, this is scary. And one of the very, very basic exercises that I teach from that protocol 
is breathing in compassion for yourself and then breathing out compassion for the person you're with, the child or the adult that you're with. Because there needs to be a nourishing and a feeding of compassion and calm and equilibrium in the caregiver so that they actually are able to do that for the child or for a partner. And so that awareness, mindful self-compassion, allows the person to recognize, yes, I am having a trauma response. I'm upset, I'm discouraged, whatever it is, recognizing that and saying, and I have compassion for myself for having that experience. May I be kind to myself, may I accept myself. So helping parents, not only, well, it's to ABC, it's to be aware and to allow and to accept whatever they're experiencing, and then to be with it, to befriend it, and then to have compassion for the experience. It's a very simple way of managing those emotions. But you have to be aware and allowing and accepting to be with it, to have compassion, so that then you can regulate your own nervous system and and act wisely. There's one other idea I wanted to throw out here, which comes from Deb Dana, who's a major teacher now about polyvagal theory. Mm. And when she's talking about learning how to manage your nervous system, she's talking about having glimmers. Not the whole thing is fixed overnight, but just having glimmers Mm. of a moment of feeling regulated, of feeling calm, of feeling some joy, feeling some connection. And for parents working with special needs children, looking for those glimmers in the child or in the parent's experience with the child, you just take those small moments of glimmers and build them into something larger because you and I both try to create the conditions that create positive brain change. Mm -hmm. And so looking for those glimmers, those moments of connection or joy or goofiness (laughs) can help relax the nervous system and allow people to function better. You know, I I got a little goosebumps. I mean, I just love what you said. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I wrote basically a whole chapter. One of my essentials is enthusiasm. But it's not enthusiasm like hoorah, rah, 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 or wait for a big event to to happen, but rather to recognize what people consider small changes, I don't consider any change small or big because it's a quantum system. So I don't know how you measure small or big change. It's a judgment in terms of our expectations, whether we think it's small or big. Mm -hmm. But the recognition of the existence of a change is there or not there. And then to internally amplify it, internally kind of bring it to the foreground and feel a sense of appreciation or joy or gratitude internally. I, I really focused on the internal because when parents did it externally during a session, they would distract the child and actually interrupt the process. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, but I also realized that when we do it internally, we impact the other brain. Absolutely. And, and I, I felt that, and you know, one time, two times, five times, and then I thought it's real. Mm-hmm. If somebody in the room and gets in sees the child now can turn the head another 10 degrees or their husband Mm -hmm. can now just move the arm for the first time or a little bit or something Mm -hmm. like that they say nothing but they amplify it then it really impacts both them i know you want to say something i'll let you in a second and the other person and the whole nervous system and the biological system is an amplification system that small things trigger a whole chain of reactions and create a big thing or a recognizable thing. So, so th- that I love connecting it to what you said, that it can be really intentional. And this may be supported by Barbara Fredrickson, who's a pioneer researcher in positive psychology. And in her book, Love 2.0, she talks about what happens when two people are in physical proximity, making eye contact, when they're sharing positive emotions like gratitude or kindness or joy or compassion, and there's a sense of mutual care and concern. She says the frequency of the brain waves of the two people begins to sync up. Mm -hmm. And the neurochemistry in the brains of the two people begins to sync up and it creates a field 
that I would call resonance, she calls love in her book, Love 2.0. So it's an intentional use of emotional contagion to shift how the brain is functioning. And so when a therapist or a parent can have that positive emotion and then connect, then that can influence the functioning of the brain of the person they're connecting with. It's important to know that, that we have that power, that we have that possibility. It's in, I think it's incredibly important because it m moves uh, us in any situation from being disempowered and victimized by what happened or by other people or by our own automatic thoughts and so on to know and, and to realize the in, in, enormous impact. I mean, I say that I think it's true, like you and I are right now, one brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, between a child and a parent, it is one brain. Right. And the model that I, I mean, it sits in two different heads, but it's, it's, <laughs> one, it's one brain. And I use the model of the dolphin, that the mama dolphin and the newborn or the, for the first three months, it's like, you know, this is the mama and this is the baby and the mama swims and create mm -hmm. the current. And the little dolphin cannot swim by themselves. They are going to sink. Mm -hmm. But they, they use the current behind the mother. Yeah. And our brains, where we come from, how we are as we interact with another person in general, but with a mm -hmm. child, it's 100%. We really regulate their brain and we bring their brain. We are the current. And, and in our current, they can start having language. They can figure out movement. They can create a sense of self. So, so that's I, I I love that what you said. And of course, the there's so many people that have so many wonderful books now that recognize it as reality because they are doing all the scans or the measurements. And so much of this has come in attachment theory and attachment research. So Dan Siegel popularized a lot of this, but there are other researchers that feed into it that yes, the mother especially, but the parents create a dual consciousness field that is larger than either just the parent or the child. And it's almost like an IV download. I mean, whatever the parent can do in terms of regulating their nervous system, regulating their emotions, relating to other people, that's almost a download into the child's brain. And eventually the child grows and begins to differentiate and they'll have their own thoughts and their own emotions. But at first it's one system. And so to realize the power of that, I love teaching my clients about neuroplasticity because when they understand that they can make intentional choices to shape their brain and to shape their brain's patterns of responding, then they feel empowered. They begin to feel a sense of mastery oh, I can do this and this and this and my brain will shift and things will go better. So yeah, I do, I do teach my clients how their brains work because they love learning that and then they can intentionally use that to change their lives. That's beautiful. And uh, so we're, we are going to close this uh, uh, podcast, Linda, and uh, I've been uh, talking and having a, an amazing conversation with my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Linda Graham. And we're going to move to the next uh, podcast, which will be um, a, about the tools. How can you start using your brain uh, to develop resilience, to heal out of trauma and not be bound by it? So thank you so much for listening. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Neuro Movement Revolution with Anab Benyel. You will find all of our podcasts and additional resources on our website at www.anatbenyelmethod.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast for free on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. We look forward to seeing you online for our next Neuro Movement Revolution.